Καλησπέρα. Κοίτα, εμείς είμαι τη μητέρα μου όταν ήρθα εδώ. Και λέει, τι κάνεις σήμερα. Well, I'm going to uh, an economist uh, outing. They've asked me to be the keynote speaker. To which my mother said, you know, honestly, when you were young, I thought you'd be delivering newspapers and the economist to people's doorsteps rather than be invited to speak at, a, at an outing. But, uh, you know, good for you, son. <laughs> Uh, I would have been proud to deliver uh, to anyone's doorstep the, uh, the economist that named Greece the country of the year in 2023. As we look ahead, I'm proud to say that U.S.-Greek relations continue to be at an all-time high. Uh, as a matter of fact, Secretary Blinken was commenting to Prime Minister Mitsotakis uh, at his home in Crete, that he could not recall another time in his 30-year foreign policy career where the relationship, the partnership, the friendship between the United States and Greece was stronger than it is now. And he said, I'm, I'm glad George didn't screw it up either. As we prepare for our fifth U.S.-Greece strategic dialogue in Washington next month, I look to even deepening this relationship with our indispensable NATO ally and partner, the government of Greece, to continue to advance our shared goals of peace and prosperity in the Eastern Mediterranean, Western Balkans, Black Sea region, and beyond, united by our shared democratic values. Greece is a stability provider and a reliable partner in the region. Now, the United States has invested in Greece's success. Trade has increased dramatically. Foreign direct investment has dr increased dramatically as our investment ties. And it's no secret that the investment community has taken notice of Greece's economic vibrancy and investment grade status. There's velocity in these investments and it's accelerating. No less than applied materials, Amazon Web Services, Chubb, Cisco, Deloitte, Digital Realty, Google, JP Morgan, Meta, Microsoft, and Pfizer are making considerable investments in Greece. The U.S. government is also investing. The DFC has invested $125 million in U.S. firms Onyx project to rehabilitate and revitalize the Elefsina shipyard, a project that will create a couple of thousand new jobs in Greece. Now, the rebirth of a major shipyard in the region is also very important from a geostrategic point of view. Additionally, USAID signed a memorandum of understanding with the government of Greece to improve energy security and cooperation in the Western Balkans. This partnership is part of a larger U.S.-Europe energy bridge, will advance collaboration between energy entities and authorities in Greece, Albania, North Macedonia, and Kosovo to integrate their electricity markets and create a more connected and secure region. As a geostrategic and economic partner, Greece has long been a pillar of stability in Southeast Europe. It is becoming an energy and transportation hub for the region, helping its neighbors wean themselves off of Russian energy and providing an alternative route for goods. I recently traveled to Moldova, Romania, and Bulgaria to meet with government and private sector leaders to explore how Greece can work with its neighbors to increase regional connectivity, especially as we look to the day when we will need to rebuild Ukraine. Increase rail, road, energy, data and information connectivity are the key to further regional integration based on increased trade and shared values. I want to point out Greece is a global leader in renewables. 60% of their needs are going to be met by renewables by the end of this year, and 80% by the end of the decade. This leadership in decarbonization is furthered by Greece's hosting the 2024 Our Ocean Conference in April. This conference unifies the world under the mission of protecting our oceans and waterways. Now, these are issues of particular importance to Greece and highlights its role as a global leader on global challenges. Now, what's 
important to all of us is inclusion and opportunity. I want to speak about inclusive education. This provides a better quality education for all children to help every child reach their full potential, a goal we all share. But it's not just the right thing to do. It makes economic sense for any country, and especially for Greece as it continues to attract record levels of foreign investment. Foreign investors and their employees expect inclusive school systems for their children, one that meets the child, especially as they seek to build inclusive teams themselves. This is critical for any country's long-term economic health. Now, speaking of inclusion, the story of my family is fairly well known. My mom and dad left a very small mountainous village. No running water, no electricity, and an outhouse on the other side of the barn. But they heard Emma Lazarus' calling and they came to the United States. They were accepted. They were able to rebuild their lives. By nature of a wonderful public education, and I went to kindergarten, I couldn't speak a word of English. But the United States accepted us, and all three of us went on to get advanced degrees in the family. We were the first in our family to go to college. My father was able to build a business. We bought a house in a good community, a safe community, great public schools, and it offered me this opportunity to serve my country here in Greece. They were full participants in American society and the American dream. And this is crucial. They were invited to belong. We have an opportunity and a collective obligation to ensure the entirety of our populace has an opportunity for economic and social advancement. This includes equalizing the opportunity for all people. Harnessing the creativity, innovation, and the entrepreneurial spirit of all people. Young people arriving on the shores of Greece or even on the shores of the United States have big dreams and untold potential. Given the right support and opportunity today, their skills and talents can contribute to a more prosperous Greece. We need to confront messages of divisiveness and we need to embrace those of opportunity and possibility, of hope and caring. Rabbi Prince, during the Holocaust, spoke about the greatest sin was silence. We cannot be nations of silent onlookers. We cannot underinvest in marginalized communities. We cannot continue we cannot continue as the world's leaders to say gender equality is something that we should seek way out in the future or not understand that love is love and that marriage is marriage, full stop, and that people should be able to love who they are, be who they are, and be accepted by everyone. This is not only the right thing to do, it's good for the bottom line. A recent study in the United States found that refugees were significantly more likely to become entrepreneurs. Just this morning, I met with a group of MIT students. Um, Secretary Summers, forgive me for mentioning that other uh, institution in Cambridge. Um, but I just met with them this morning. Some of them were refugees themselves who traveled to Athens to join a Greek NGO and leading an engineering design workshop for unaccompanied children to develop problem-solving and entrepreneurial skills, which will benefit Greece as well as their home countries if they have an opportunity to return. Folks, think of the determination it takes for a mother to put her two-year-old on her shoulders and take her four-year-old in her arms and get into an inflatable and risk all of their lives. They don't come to destroy one's country. They come because they're seeking safety and an opportunity to provide a better life for their families. This is an ethos we need 
to embrace because it benefits all of us. When everyone participates, our economies grow faster. Entire societies grow stronger, more creative, more prosperous, and more free. This, at its core, the promise of democracy and the mark of a great society. We need the entirety of our society's participation if we are going to effectively address the great global challenges of today, like climate change and food insecurity and divergent economic opportunity. I wanted to speak about democracy. A lot of people tell me that democracy is an outmoded way of governance. When my country stood up a government 248 years ago, it borrowed the values, the ethos, the lessons of the government that was founded right here thousands of years ago in Athens. For the first time ever, people came together with a sense of self-determination about their governance. Democracy isn't going anywhere. It's enduring. Folks, no one's trying to move to Venezuela. No one's trying to move to Russia. And I assure you, Iran does not have an immigration problem. People are trying to move to democracies, not only because of the freedoms that it offers, but because living in democracies, you tend to have economies and societies that are safer, more opportunistic, and more vibrant. But it's our collective obligation as thought leaders and people who have done well and people who have privilege that we practice the ethos of tukum alam, to repair the world one person, one situation at a time, that we make sure that everyone has an opportunity to be the best version of themselves and to fully participate in all of the gifts and benefits that we have in this country and in my country, and to understand each and every day how fortunate we are to be born here, and to make sure that as there are over 8 billion people in this world, that not everyone is so fortunate. Thank you all very much. It's a great honor for me tonight.